Welcome to an episode of the award-winning podcast, Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. The theme of the podcast is New York, with a focus on behind-the-scenes conversations with fascinating people who are making an impact in the world of art, design, and architecture. The award-winning photographer Mark Seliger was Rolling Stone's chief photographer from 1992 to 2002, where he shot over 175 covers. From 2002 to 2012, he was on contract with Condé Nast, where he shot regularly for Vanity Fair and GQ. We talk about Mark's latest book, The City That Finally Sleeps, where during the pandemic, quote, he took to the desolate streets, camera in hand, and often in the quietest hours. These hauntingly beautiful portraits of New York streets and cityscapes grip the viewer in varying balances of beauty, sorrow, wonder, and quiet concern, end quote. All the proceeds from the sale of the book goes to New York Cares in their COVID-19 relief efforts. We also talk about Mark's creative process as a photographer, as well as a singer and songwriter in the country and western group Rusty Truck. You will hear excerpts of his songs during the interview. For those of our listeners who do not know who you are, maybe a few of them, so you have been the Rolling Stone chief photographer from 92 to 2002, where you shot 175 covers. Now, I saw in one interview here that you said when you came to Rolling Stones, you wanted to do 50 covers and 50 assignments. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, how many days are there in a year? <laughs> how, how did you accomplish that? Well, I, uh, the, the, well, it really wasn't that. It was uh, when I signed on to Rolling Stone, um, I was assigned 10 covers a year and... I think it was 35 assignments or 40 assignments on top of that. And then what ended up happening is I shot over 100 assignments for them. And uh, typically I'd only do 10 covers a year or 12 covers a year. It's a a bi-weekly, so it's twice a month. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, they just kept me on planes and moving around. And it, 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 it was kind of more music centric at first. And then it really blossomed into comedy and into portraiture and into, you know, journalistic stories. And that was, uh, you know, it was very well rounded for me. So it kept me busy. And then I went on to go to Vanity Fair and GQ for 10 years. A very similar exclusive relationship where, um, you know, I did not quite as many assignments, but some really interesting ones. So they they also uh, they gave me a uh, a nice body of work, even with the amount of commission photographers they had. So it was great. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that the, when I was preparing this interview that. There's so many people for so long that have seen the world through your eyes or through your lens. I mean, do you ever think about that? How you maybe have had an impact on contemporary culture through your photography? Well, I don't really think about uh, that stuff. We're pretty much on to the next thing once things get uh, finished. You know, I think about... Uh, in terms of legacy, which is is something that I think every crosses everybody's mind, um, Matthew Barney put it best to me. He said, it, "It's not how much you leave behind; it's it's the you know it's the limited amount that you leave behind." Yeah. And so, you know, we are in a in a different place and time too. So our photographs really work as, in my opinion, they're sort of like. Uh, glorified fanzine uh, images, you know, like it's it's for the fans, right? And and so it's a very immediate thing, even in terms of magazines, which um, is a whole other discussion. There's such power to the idea of a single image, right? Like that is really the way that people are introduced to things, and then it takes them into the story behind that. And, uh, and that's really what I tried to do. I tried to make the sort of the power of the portrait or the photograph bring you into the story. And that was really my impetus behind 
uh, the work that I did in magazines of Rolling Stone or Vanity Fair GQ or any of the magazines I've worked with in fashion magazine I work with too, is that the photograph really represents the the kind of the cover of that story and then it leads you through there. And and it was always about trying to sort of outdo myself. I didn't wasn't aiming to to have any kind of competition with anybody else or myself. It was like, how can I make this special? This possibly could be the last time that I ever photograph this person. So I want to make it very, you know, neat. I, I'm a very lucky person. I've always said we were, you know, I was in the in the right place at the right time. Um, I was dri- super driven. Yeah, I was a light in the '80s, late in the late '80s in uh, New York City. And I was like, I had no idea because I didn't really live here. I was I was traveling. I was working as an assistant, and I was starting to travel and work as a photographer. So <laughs> I always kind of had my nose down to the grindstone to be able just to, you know, to kind of live it fully. You know, I think legacy for me is really editing right now, right? Like I think about obviously projects I'm working on this point in time when uh, there's so much discussion about the evolution of prioritizing our our values as a human race. And I think it's important to be able to tell these stories. And uh, even though I love pop culture, I really thrive best when there's messaging involved. The books that I've worked on that I think are closest to my heart are this book that we just did, This Is That Finally Sleeps, which is all about the lockdown uh, and not on a, a person's perspective, but almost as a love letter to New York City. New York has provided this blank canvas for artists and for people who are interested, interested in exploring. And, you know, I, I just felt a sort of melancholy about what was happening, but also a very kind of a positive reset for the city and for the people that live amongst it. And then I'm also really passionate about the Christopher Street Project, project which was all about the banishing of the West Village and the theater of Christopher Street, yeah. which, which was really uh, uninten- an unintentional a documentary on transgender, which is where I kind of found my way through that story, you know, a third of the way into. And so these are also in my first book, which I did was on survivors of the Holocaust. So these are all interesting topics to me, you know, to be able to cement those ideas without necessarily having to illustrate, you know, a magazine cover. I see. And the magazine covers and the editorial and the advertising that we do really is like a, you know, it is kind of the big sister. So we try to put as much of the same spin on it as I would in, if I was shooting for myself. So it's very, they're very similar. There were two things that inspired you to become a photographer. One was the magic of the of the dark room, and the other one's your passion for documentary. And I think that's what you're talking about here. That's what shines through in these projects, right? For me, it's always been about the print, right? That's the other 50% that I always thought about. Like, how is that going to look, you know, if you want to call it like a print being on a page or being on a wall or being in somebody's home or a gallery or a museum, whatever it is. The process to me is so much about the way that we think in terms of our work world, right? Like we always start with process before we start with necessarily an idea. Like what is the process? What are we, you know, what are we thinking about in terms of, you know, the printed printed piece? And then we think about the equipment that we're going to use in order to be able to bring this all to life. And then as we move through, an idea, which is usually a small section of photographs, sessions, we start to decide on, is this going to be like, you know, it's like ordering on a big deli menu, right? It's like, <laughs> I feel like that's a Swedish meatball, or do I want to have myself a uh, <laughs> chicken fried steak, or is it going to be like a cheese enchilada, right? <laughs> so you round that corner and you really dig deep into it. It's all those components that make the project. Yeah. So let's talk about your most recent book, The City That Finally Sleeps, and it's only sold on your website. Website and also on our Instagram. And the website is? MarkSelliger.com. 
The project really came together for me when uh, I was pretty much setting up to be hunkered down for a minute. And I was driving through the West Village, going home to the studio. And all around the West Village was this incredible cascade of cherry blossoms. And so you have this incredible force of nature that we see a couple times a year. And there was nobody on the street. It was um, a very rainy, kind of silvery pavement, dusk approaching, very misty. And I had my camera and I just pulled over. I was going home, pulled over, and I started to just sort of document the streets out of curiosity. The first image we sent on Instagram, and people really responded to the idea of these images coming out into the, to their world. Perhaps they had already left town and were, you know, uh, exiled for the pandemic, or there was a moment where people were, uh, you know, expats of New York and living in different places and still obviously had an affinity for the city and wanted to know what was going on, what was that like to be in, in lockdown. So there was this really immense curiosity. So I sort of took that as my lead and I started to document different parts of the city, pretty much picking you know, mornings and evenings, and then sometimes during rainy days, middle of the days, but it was the same emptiness, which was pretty odd. And, uh, and then that led me to doing a little portfolio for Vanity Fair on the, uh, the, the, the kind of the early stages of the pandemic and the lockdown. And then after that was published, we started to, to really dig our heels in it. So really between March and, uh, you know, the end of May when George Floyd was killed and the city, you know, roared right back into, into life in, in terms of, of, you know, people really speaking their minds, which was fantastic and such a tragic moment, I think, for all of us. It just built. And I think one of the highlights for me was when I was working for the Vanity Fair portion of this, they sent me over to the Javits Center and, and that kind of activated me to photograph things that were a little bit outside of the landscape of the city, but the kind of the new landscape of the city. Still no people, but definitely to show the, you know, the kind of like sort of secret inner moments of things that were happening around New York City at the time to prep for, you know, what we all saw was pretty devastating. You know, that was primarily it. Every day it was kind of a new venture and it was very lawless. You could kind of travel anywhere. You could park on the side of the FDR. You could, <laughs> you know, off bridges. And there was these moments that were just, uh, you know, to imagine that you could go anywhere in New York without any type of hassle yeah. and set up. It was like being on a movie set, right? It was, it was incredible. I remember we were flying drones around a little bit. We bought these little drones, which we crashed about three of them <laughs> and, uh, and trying to figure out how to do that. And we were so nervous about getting stopped by, you know, the police. But yeah. I don't think anybody was really looking around. So we just kind of knew what we were doing and, uh, and never got stopped. I had a ladder one time in the middle of Park Avenue at four o'clock in the afternoon and it was about a 20 foot tall ladder stuck right in the middle of the street. And taxis just like went right around me. There, there was nobody that was, you know, no honking, no nothing. They just assumed I was out there to do my job. There are a number of wonderful uh, photos here, uh, and there were some of them that, that really uh, touched me. I mean, there's, uh, as I said, there are not many people in the photos, but there's one guy on a bike in Chinatown, and I thought that was, that was very poignant. And then you have this Times Square. Um, it's almost like a scene from Blade Runner, where you have this poster thanking the first responder. I mean, I think that's what it felt like. It felt like the movie I Am Land you know, with Will Smith. And uh, amongst all those walls are millions of people, you know, watching the news and streaming or being families waiting for, you know, the sign that this was going to calm down a little bit. And so there was no tourists. There was no activity on the streets. And it, like I said, it was, it was just sublime and surreal. I was knocked down by a hurricane 
Let me stand in in the pouring rain Just to lay down beside you Just to feel all the pain Well, all, all, all the kisses you gave Buttons and ribbons you say Cast down these walls you made Lead me from here There's a broken down Ferris how did you get access to the Javid Center? Because you have an incredible photo there of a sort of the cubicleized hospital care. The way that we got into the Javid Center was was uh, really through our, our team at, uh, at Vanity Fair. Originally, I thought we were going to be able to photograph within the, the occupied hospital. There were two sides. One was occupied and one was obviously like, you know, overflow. And so the empty part of the Javid sort of made more sense to me anyway because it went more with what I was doing on the project. And secondly, you weren't allowed in there. It was just, you know, way too, uh, you know, the security and the and the privacy was just way too, uh, you know, extreme. So, and I, that, that's understandable. Were you ever at all, um, you know, afraid of your own safety or health? Yeah, I mean, not really, but I was extremely careful every day. I mean, we were working uh, in the office with, you know, my assistant, and that was kind of the rules that we can do this, but we have to, you know, make sure that we're not going out and putting ourselves in any danger. We were heavily masked and gloved and, you know, really took the proper care in order to be able not to expose ourselves. It's like you're rediscovering your city again. And I love this story about the Washington Square where you all of a sudden realize that there, uh, the meaning of the inscription, I, I mean, maybe you've seen the inscription on top of that arc before. One of the magnifications, I think, of having an empty, large metropolis like New York is that you start to notice the detail that went into building the city. Things like the Washington Square Park quote from George Washington was one of those breakthrough moments for me because I actually didn't even read it until I got home and and, and started really editing my film. Yeah, I, I saw that quote, let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. It has to do with uh, wanting to reach a higher level, a higher purpose. I think it's all about like being aware of the difference between mediocrity and pushing to have a higher level of morality and value. And, uh, and then I went out and we photographed on, uh, uh, in Harlem and we found the Apollo Theater, which said, be well. And there was this moment we, we were photographing the Robert Indiana sculpture, Hope, and behind it was a Chase Manhattan bank sign, so it said Chase Hope. So there were moments where there was little messages in the city that kind of talked to us. That was our, that was also one of our guides was how, you know, the individual companies and the places that we had uh, visited over the years kind of obviously experience, you know, all kinds of, of moments of in intensity. And these were ways to express that. And I also have to say what really moved me was the, the High Line, uh, the MetLife building in Park Avenue, of course, and the Grand Central Terminal. The Grand Central Terminal, empty like that, it's, it, you really see what a piece of art it is. It's, it's just fantastic. Yeah, I know. And that's, that's true. I, I think the appreciation of the detail of the city is, it was really heightened during that time. Even the somewhat like dilapidated movie sets that we would find on McDougal Street or even in Chinatown, there was like the, the incredible, you know, um, factories that had been built up there that are, you know, it's definitely a part of New York, but it's not the most 
handsome part of New York, but it does it does really ring as a handsome experience when you're there and nobody's around. I knew the project was was over. Uh, from my part was over once the streets lit up and there was that incredible you know roar of of being angry and being feeling that social injustice and that need to go out and the voices being heard and I thought that was really important but it was also important for me to reflect on that without a camera in my hand and though there are a couple ending photographs that uh, suggest that things have changed and uh, there's this one experience which was uh, being in Soho right after Floyd was killed and there was a mattress sitting in the middle of the street and it was vertical and it had R.I.P. George Floyd on it and it was really that was such a powerful message because there was no doubt that that was put up there as a grave, as a gravestone, and how perfect of a representation of New York put a, a mattress on the street. And so that, to me, was uh, not necessarily a picture I would have taken, but I thought it helped transition from us going to a very, you know, isolated uh, internal relationships with ourselves to really coming together as New Yorkers and expressing how we felt about that kind of injustice. I would say one of the more uh, uh, surprising moments is that when we went out to Coney Island, uh, my assistant Davis and McCutcheon and I went to Coney Island and he was actually flying drone around there. And I did just a couple of pictures just to see if I could get anything. And I found this one incredible moment where they had raked the sand probably weeks and weeks and weeks before and it had settled in there and there was this like crazy kind of undulating line through the sand from these tractors and then a completely empty boardwalk. And, you know, I think of it in terms of more of the design of the image than the actual uh, messaging of the image. And that's really the way I tried to approach each photograph. Rather than just taking a picture of a building, it was more about the design. So how did you shoot the Chrysler building? Because in this um, fold-out, you have the Chrysler building, the Empire State building. Was that a drone, too? No. Um, uh, one of our location scouts that we work, one of the location scouts we work with all the time, um, has a nice connection at the MetLife building. Usually that would be like a $25,000 location fee. And because there was only a couple of people working, you know, the security, he got us through in order to be able to get in uh, on a Saturday. And it just turned out to be one of the nicer days that we had at that time, which was crazy because, you know, it had been raining and it had been wet and certainly very springy. And then all of a sudden we had one of those beautiful skies that you only get you know in new york where you know it's kind of touching on cold and warm you know intersections and the clouds all of a sudden came out in this perfect quite kind of summery late uh spring formation and we could see all the way to the long island sound from 34th street yeah and it was really it was really amazing that they let us up there and we just picked it Somehow, we, the day that they gave us and the day that we went up there was just the perfect day for us to be shooting. And there was no wind and the beginning of sunset until there were no more, there was no more light in the city besides the twinkling of the skyscrapers. It was amazing. You talked about your, your previous books here, Photographs 2018 on Christopher Street 2017. Um, then you did Cuba 2015 and uh, Listen 2010. The music book, I'm happy I have a signed copy of it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, In My Stairwell 2005. We worked uh, pretty hard at kind of midpoint with the Brooklyn Academy of Music to be able to really highlight some of the incredible artists that passed through uh, that theater. 
Um, and at that time I was, you know, really curious about that type of performance. So I focused more on artists of that world, but then we had people coming to the studio that I just could not let go. So, you know, like Paul Marotti and then Giorgio Armani and Tom Wolfe and, you know, it just, it just seemed like, okay, you might as well just go for it. Let's talk a little bit about the creative process and, and also I'd like to talk a little bit about your music. I'd love to. I've seen you perform in, in New York uh, a couple of times and I really yeah. loved it. And uh, so the creative process, I was very curious about this because I've seen your Oscar, um, your Oscar series, if I can call it like that. And Our photo booth at the Oscar party? Well, photo booth, I mean, it's, it's, it's much more ambitious than that. I mean, I've seen some, some, some articles about that. You actually built uh, an environment. How do you keep it interesting and fresh, even though you're in the same environment? Uh, that's a really good question, Anders. What, what, what goes into that process of putting together that event? That is a very lengthy process, right? Like what I do is I start out working with my set designer on some very simple ideas that I sketch out to him. He takes them and realizes what it could possibly be. You know, the scope of the space, it's going to be about 15 feet wide and about 20 feet deep and about 15 foot ceilings. So we're limited. But over the years, they, they continually give us a little bit more uh, territory, but not much. As we move through each year, we kind of find what worked and what didn't work, right? The last three years, we basically built an environment that we can use the entire environment by lighting everything from outside of the room, which meant that we went from basically using the strobe light, right? Like just an umbrella against the wall to creating a space with continuous lights. And we're working with a lighting designer to be able to shift different colored elements in lighting ideas as the night goes on. So, you know, I'm pointing to like which lights turn off when my next subject comes on. And then we create, Thomas Thurnauer, the set designer, creates a room that no matter where we are, there's some point of entrance. After testing where I can move, because I want to stay very nimble, sometimes these shoots are 30 seconds long. Sometimes they're a minute and a half, but no more than that. And you're trying to figure out how to do that. So my goal is to be able to be pretty nimble through the process and to be able to control a quality of light. So maybe there's like a nighttime scene. Maybe there's like a sunset scene. Maybe there's just an incandescent scene. And the lighting designer and I, as we're moving through that, he's also pulling in little hand lights that are just going to accent stuff to create like a little bit more of a sense of glamour or depth or whatever. Computer controller is on the side watching him and he's watching me and what I want to do. So lighting changes within the switch of a button. Something is pre-programmed, so all we have to do is just go, take me to one, let's go to three. And as we move through that, I might fine tune it. Okay, three was really good, but turn off the side light. And so we create out another source of light. So the lighting is really kind of the 50% to the set. And then all the work that I do beforehand of setting things up is how we control the different feelings. Now, the big ambition is when somebody comes in is to create a room for them that they, that there's, you know, they feel excited about, give them a lot of direction, pose them, talk them through what I want them to do, move this way, move that way, turn your head right. And then that's the way we get a portrait. Very, very much the way that we work, you know, in the studio, except for we're not 
getting two hours with them, we're getting, you know, 50 seconds. So I, I was associating to like a Parisian apartment of some, uh, you know, an old Parisian apartment in some of the more recent ones you did, which I thought was very... The last one was the North Light Studio. The other one was like sort of a, a Moroccan interior in, a, in Paris. <laughs> I love that. You were like transported. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Is that you never know that you're in the middle of the night when you're shooting those things, right? Like you look at those pictures and you think, Oh, what chateau did they stop at before they went to the uh, to the park? Your method to me seems to be like you do a lot of research. You try to figure out something about this person, right? And you talk to this person, you interact yeah. with this person. What are you looking for when you meet a person? What? What? Are you, because you said something here that that you're looking for something different, like a wink, like something that you could do that has not been done before. But still, it has to relate to the personality uh, of the person. I mean, you cannot take too many artistic uh, uh, liberties here because then you would it would look uh, strange, right? No, not at all. I mean, I think I think the way that I worked in the early days um, of my career was that I didn't want to share a lot with my talent up front uh -huh. because it gives them too much time to think about. It. So I would set up everything from the ridiculous to the sublime. <laughs> and, um, and then depending on how they felt about it, we would either go that direction or we would go to a midpoint or we would do everything and kind of, you know, figure out which one worked best or yeah. use all. Um, and, you know, you, you really line yourself up to, to failure in that way too, because a publicist could shoot you down the artist would go like, well, that does not really me. Yeah. But I've always been one to want to try. So I kind of push that. Um, the other aspect of that is, is, you know, is observation. So when you're working with somebody, there may be a particular way that they sit outside of the actual session. You know, when you're talking to them, they may do something that feels, you know, very unique, but they wouldn't normally do it if not directed. So I'm kind of picking up on those cues as I'm talking to them, so I'm getting to know them. You know, maybe this side's going to light better, so I'm going to focus on that. Maybe they, you know, if there's if there's some kind of wink to it, is it like a little wink? Is it a big joke? And, um, you know, you think about comedy. Comedy is one of those things that it's fine when you're on stage and you have an audio to what you're describing, but in a still photograph, You don't have that audio. You need to be able to tell that story. It's almost, almost like making a silent movie. I was thinking about the parallels to a metteur en scène. Like, like you're setting somehow the, the stage for a, a session. Have you ever thought about doing films or, or, or theater? Yeah, I mean, the motion aspect of what we do now is pretty big. The idea of doing a film sounds great, but... I just would have to have the right amount of time to be able to do it, right? It's it's all consuming. And it's not like just a you know, four month period, it's like a year and change at the very minimal amount, a year and change in writing and prepping and shooting that, you know, I have too much fun and enjoy too much what I get to do and then turn it off after the day and move on to the next thing. So we sort of make films all day long, but, <laughs> you know, I get to do different films every day. Another aspect of your work is you say that you have you you draw ideas you 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 present ideas. Have you ever thought of doing like Christo to document the process behind the process? Not really. I mean, I I don't think that stuff is really information that I'm interested in showing. That's just to give me to from point A to point B, really. And uh, the sketches are so bad. I would feel horrible for my family to, <laughs> to, to know that they're out in the world because they would just get heckled. You said here in an interview that so many times when I'm explaining process to people, it has nothing to do with the technical. It has to do with the idea. The technical aspect is pretty easy because it's arithmetic, it's math. 
So how do you find inspiration in your work? Because there must be something in your subconscious that happens in the idea department. You know, you know this as, good, as well as anybody does, that inspiration really comes from anything that you gravitate towards. It could be looking at a window or it could be hearing an incredible lyric on in music or um, a great jazz solo, right? It could be from simply watching the water move. Everything is inspiration. I built some of my best sets from just, you know, seeing a color in a video that I was watching or the, of the musical group that I was about to photograph. I saw, oh, I like the idea of teal. That sounds like sort of the direction I want to go. We may just start from that. It may just be teal is the main inspiration. Yeah. Or it may be, you know, I'm in a restaurant and I see a corner of the restaurant that feels like it would make a beautiful little set. You know, there's a tapestry wall that I just thought, oh, wow, I think a tapestry wall could be perfect for this subject. Or maybe it's just a very reductive portrait and, you know, I'm captivated by seeing their expression on the research I'm doing. And I think, well, you know what, a really beautiful close-up of their eyes is all it really needs to be. So inspiration comes from really anything that I, you know, that I'm open to in my daily life. But I'm usually looking for something while I'm working on that particular project. You know, I just I don't store those ideas necessarily randomly. It usually comes from taking a walk while I'm in the middle of a project and something just sort of sparks. Or I'm listening to a piece of music of theirs and one word comes out or a line comes out and I think, okay, what if I turn that into an idea? So it's about staying in touch with your um, subconscious and letting these uh, ideas uh, come up. Oh, Lord, I don't know. I don't know how it comes up. I have a crazy mind, I think, that uh, is is very active uh, in, uh, in just digging deep into, like, what would be a great photograph. And uh, I've been wrong many times. You mentioned in some interviews that I read that originality, in my opinion, is the key to a long journey. And I think that uh, maybe that explains um, a lot in your work, in your career, this creativity that goes into every project that you are involved with. Usually when I finish a project, I'm done with it. Like I, even with, you know, shooting in my stairwell for an entire book, I go back in there now and it's like a bad night after drinking, you know, cheap tequila, you just go like, oh, I don't think I could ever have another glass of tequila ever again. <laughs> and it's kind of like that way when you're walking in the stairwell. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to just any time in here. You know, that was <laughs> it's not my place anymore, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I usually, once I'm wrapped with the project, I'm done. And I move on to the next thing. I feel like when I do repeat myself, it's it's not really an obvious repeat. It's just a tool. Like, you know, photography is a paintbrush. And so those are kind of the given moments. Like, right? that's the map, right? And people might have some sort of an association with that as being like your signature. But it's really not. It's just, it's just that's the way that the technique works. I, I'm always interested in what what's out there next. Yeah. Um, music, music in your life. You said, I have a little country band. It's called Rusty Truck, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. so, so is there a connection between music and photography? You used to say this cliche about, you know, architecture is like frozen music. You know, people who are in the music business, they're probably very good at painting or whatever. I found songwriting to be the interest to me. It wasn't, it wasn't going out and playing on you know, live necessarily. It was more about crafting a song. And so that's where I started out in music was more or less kind of attempting poetry. Then I've always sang. I've always been interested in singing. I'm not a very good guitar player. I can't really play piano. Like I, my mom really wanted me to be able to play piano and sing the lessons for years. And I still am terrible at it. Uh, but I do work in my voice because I feel as if that's the instrument. The even greater idea to, to writing songs is 
very much like photography, the idea starts first. And what I mean by that is it's a storyline. So there are characters within these stories. These characters have some kind of a destination. And it's always very visual. So when we're painting that idea in a song, it's not dissimilar to the way that we paint the same idea in a photograph. Mm. Still with the same language, it's still with the same same language and the same methods. It's just more about lyrics. Yeah, that's a wonderful way of putting it. When are you performing next? I'm just finishing a new record with Larry Campbell, the uh, very talented, amazing musician who played with Dylan for 10 years. And, you know, he's a multi-instrumentalist. He's made songs with Emmylou Harris, and he's made songs with uh, Yvonne Helms, worked with him very closely. Oh, yeah. And so he and I worked together on this record along with one of my bandmates, Michael Duff, and created a new body of work. So I'm one song away from having a new record out. Do you write the, the music and the lyrics, or do you write it together? I'm usually writing the beginnings of everything in terms of the music. Now, that gets carved down, obviously, with the producer. And then they reinterpret it with the same direction, usually, but obviously under the microscope. How many albums have you done so far? Third record, yeah. And where can people find your music? My music is on iTunes. So you can go to iTunes or you can go to any of these, you know, streaming services and listen to Rusty Truck. It is not under my name. <laughs> you just say like, oh, I'm Rusty. Yeah. <laughs> Country and Western is in your DNA then, coming from Texas. Is that the correct? Yeah, word? I mean, I would say... We're definitely more country western than country. <laughs> country. Country western being the oper operative word for music before 1990. And, uh, you know, my heroes are, are a lot of Texas players, you know, Willie Nelson, uh, Merle Haggard, George Jones, yeah. um, Leon Russell, who oh, yeah. uh, was kind of, I think he was Texas, Oklahoma. Big fan of Elvis Costello. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of tip into the world of what I call it, sort of alternative country. So it's it's kind of a, a, a modern twist on old like seventies country. So we don't we don't go into the Nashville world. We stay pretty close to the Texas world. I see. So what is the photo that you haven't taken? Well, I don't know yet because I haven't taken it. What do you dream about though? Well, one of the projects we've been working on that's that's coming along is actually not a, a, a still photograph, but it's a body of work that I'm doing called Isolation. And it's more stream of consciousness. It's about kind of the inner films in our minds. And I'm working with uh, a lot of um, artists in the theater world and the acting world to be able to illustrate these ideas in our one minute long films. And it's all about kind of your inner thoughts. Wow. Deep. Very deep. I love that. Where are we in the, in the timeline for that? Um, I'm about, I would say I'm about 75% done. And then I'm going to jump back into it now that I've got a little bit more space and things are opening up. We had to kind of shut that project down. Mark Seliger, uh, thank you so much. I know this is a very busy time for you because you've just released uh, your latest book, The City That Finally Sleeps. And if you buy this book, you're helping New York Cares. New York Cares, and all the proceeds go to New York Cares. And you can buy it on markseliger.com or on uh, via your Instagram account. That is correct. Thank you very much. Dennis. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, and it really is a, a historic documentation of a New York City. New York City when it sleeps and that doesn't happen very often thank you Anders great to see you good to see you thank you this is Art Insiders New York and my name is Anders Holst if you enjoyed this episode and have family and friends who love New York and are passionate about the world of art design and architecture in the city please spread the word by following us on artinsidersnewyork.com or liking us on our Facebook page Art Insiders New York where we publish newsworthy material all the time. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. This episode was produced by UOM LLC, copyright 2021. Two 
steps back, Lord, the sky's gone gray. Taking bets on this sunny old day. I want to know what wins. I want to know what pays. What's to lose and then what's to gain. Oh, the kisses you gave Got the buttons and ribbons you say Cast down these walls you made Lead me from here That was a good one. <laughs>